Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first meeting in the 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. I wish everybody a happy new year. Let's hope it's a healthy and successful one as well. And uh, I have apologies from Cara Hilton today. Uh, before we move to the first item, uh, we should remember to switch off all mobile phones. They can affect the broadcasting system. And if you're using uh, tablets, it's for uh, the benefit of uh, your work in the committee. That's the only purpose they should be here on the desks. Thank you very much. So agenda item one is Scotland's National Marine Plan. And uh, this is uh, an evidence-taking session in round table format. And I very much welcome our witnesses today. So what I'll do is just to go round the table. I'm the convener, Rob Gibson, for uh, MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. And then Annie is next. Can you tell uh, us who I'm you Annie Breeden from the Crown Estate. Thank you. Richard Valentine, British Port Association. Claudia Beamish, uh, MSP for South Scotland and Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Phil Thomas, Scottish Salmon Breeders Organisation. Uh, Dave Thompson, MSP for Skylark, Aber and Bednach. Lucy Greenhill from the Scottish Association for Marine Science. Alan Broadbent, Scottish and Southern Energy Power Distribution. Uh, Alex Ferguson, MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. Uh, Bertie Armstrong. Bertie Armstrong, Chief Executive of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation. Jim Hume, MSP for South Scotland. Uh, David Levin, Scottish Enterprise. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. Uh, Callum Duncan, Scotland Programme Manager for the Marine Conservation Society, also Convene Links Marine Task Force. Uh, Graeme Day, MSP for Angus South and Deputy Convener of the Committee. So that's uh, all who's here and uh, Mike Russell's just going to arrive very soon between Annie and hey, Richard. So welcome everybody. If you wish to speak, just indicate to me the uh, sound system works via the sound technician, you don't need to switch anything on and off. He will, or I will, if you're speaking too long. <laughs> so uh, the draft National Marine Plan, uh, you as stakeholders have uh, looked at this in considerable detail, been consulted uh, to a greater or lesser extent. And, um, you know, there's questions in my mind about the clarity of purpose, uh, the clarity of when it applies, uh, about how the National Marine Plan improves on current practice. You know, to sum that up, would anybody like to say what difference is it going to make to your particular sector in terms of uh, the way in which you will operate in future in relation to the plan and in relation to your sector's activities? Phil Thomas? I think your point at the start of clarity of purpose is, is actually quite a good kind of point to start because in some ways uh, from, from my perspective I would see the plan as providing two things or should be providing two things. One is an overarching framework for planning which I think is a kind of public uh, approach. The second in a sense is that it's acting as a, a prospectus almost for investors because it sets the tone for the whole of the investment environment into the development of marine facilities of whatever type. Uh, now Scotland is, is quite well placed I think in terms of marine resources for that development and, and this plan is, a, is, is an element in that. Um, I think for me the uh, problem with the plan is that uh, it is probably more advanced than that in any other EU region. Um, a number of other people are working on similar plans, but I think Scotland is a bit ahead. Uh, but it does have some uh, areas where it's still pretty grey and where you would debate whether or not the balance is quite right. And in particular now it's becoming overtaken by events because policy is moving around it quite rapidly. Um, so uh, I think it's a good start. I don't think at this stage I'm in a good position to tell you exactly what impact it would have on the aquaculture sector, although it's quite clear potentially it could have a very significant impact. Well, we'll have a look at various shades of grey then uh, as we go through uh, each of the sectors, I think, in terms of questions. But generally at the start, uh, Lucy Greenhill. Um, 
I think because I don't represent a specific sector, so I come from more a, a broader perspective, I guess, and from the environmental perspective in particular. I think the main benefit that we see the marine plan and process could provide is that ability to assess cumulative impacts across multiple sectors. So I think one of the areas or well, the points at which individual sectors struggle in the consent and decision-making process is where you have to assess the impacts of, um, say, a wind farm development and oil and gas or multiple wind farm developments together. And I think a broader marine planning process could provide a framework for dealing with that in a more streamlined way. But I do think at this stage it's, it's a potential opportunity. It's not um, how that actually works in practice hasn't, hasn't been set out as yet. I would say. Okay, Bertie Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, can I just um, mention that? Um, could, could I just mention that uh, that I, I thought particularly helpful was the uh, Marine Scotland web page, which now has collected all the documents which are relevant to the present inspection. I thought that was well done, and that's helpful. Um, from our point of view, uh, to reiterate some things that other people have said, clarity of planning for us is very important because we need to know where we stand and, and investment decisions are, are built on that. Um, our, our approach to it very specifically has been that there should be a recognition of some form of protection for already established uh, sustainable uses of the sea, and, and that's clear in our uh, that's clear in our deposition um, to the consultation. And um, we take a slightly different approach, uh, but, but use the same words as Lucy did with regard to cumulative effect. Uh, um, she, 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 I'm assuming she was referring to cumulative effect on the environment. And of course, uh, uh, for us, uh, the cumulative effect of large numbers of small developments on the overall shape of the Scottish fishing industry is something that's uh, terribly important f for us. And topically, um, we are very, uh, very uh, keen that um, the section on uh, cable laying uh, is, is, makes proper sense. It, it contains most of our requirements, uh, um, and, and we're pleased about that, um, and because that's something that will be increasingly uh, uh, in the news. So, in general terms, we are, we, we are pleased uh, 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 with, with what has come out. We still want to see uh, an even-handedness in recognizing those sustainable industries that already exist, in, uh, in, instead of, um, as the bill does, give, give an overall preference for new development. Indeed, we will come to cables in due course, uh, like many other points. Uh, David, David Levin. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, uh, Scottish Enterprises' objective is to ensure that the economic potential of the marine environment is optimised, and we are quite pleased that this marine plan will support that. Um, my specific remit is with the energy sector, and we are pleased that the uh, marine plan will play an important part in relation to offering for the first time a full and ambitious statement of Scotland's ambition around the economic potential of, of the marine environment. So, that's, that's good. Um, also, we're pleased that the Marine Plan will um, attempt to and will go some way to achieve uh, the, the delivery of a mechanism for better levels of coordination of action and investment to support the exploitation in a sustainable way of the uh, economic potential of the, the marine environment. Also, we hope and are, and are pleased that it will deliver to some extent clarity and uh, certainty for investors in marine energy projects and also as part of that support a faster and more efficient decision-making process around, around that. So those are our interests in this, this, this plan. Thank you. So it makes a difference for your sector to have that clarity? Absolutely. Right. Uh, Callum Duncan. Thank you. Um, the, the, we welcome the, the National Marine Plan as a, a step change in how our seas are, are managed and provides a great opportunity to address the concerns about cum cumulative impacts that have already been uh, raised. Um, the, the purpose of the plan uh, is, an, is, is improved from the previous draft. Um, it says that it would make an important contribution to sustainable development. I think I'd like to be clear on the record that we actually think the National Marine Plan should 
be in order to deliver sustainable development, um, which is ultimately uh, sound science, good governance, and sustainable economic activity contributing to a just society living within environmental limits. So there's, there's, there's uh, still a slight framing issue there, I think, about what, what the plan uh, should be for. And some of the sectoral chapters threw up some of the confused thinking around that, I think. So, for example, we, um, we're concerned that the, the plan still has a, a national target for aquaculture expansion, and we're concerned that the, the plan as regards oil and gas doesn't uh, ap appropriately recognise and address the concerns about the climate change impact of continued uh, fossil fuel extraction, uh, albeit there is some language about needing to transition to a low carbon economy. You know, the balance of language isn't quite right there from, from our perspective. The, I'm sure there'll be opportunities to elaborate on some of these points further, but th the last point I'd like to make is I think we're, we, st we still think there, um, there is much greater scope for the plan to be ambitious in terms of enhancing the health of our marine environment. Uh, if we look at the spectrum of environmental health, where we are on the baseline is still in a very denuded marine environment. The Firth of Forth, once upon a time, had 129 square kilometres of native oysters. Um, and I, I, I still don't see the ambition for enhancement being commensurate with uh, what Scotland's Marine Act list clearly shows to be uh, 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 marine environment uh, about which there are a number of very substantial concerns and ongoing declines. Um, but it's great that we now have a framework within which we can, we can discuss how best to manage all the activities to deliver sustainable development. Alan Broadbent. Good morning, convener, and thanks very much for inviting me along today to give evidence. <clears throat> we are really, as, as a company, essentially concerned with Chapter 14, which, which is actually new to, to, to the plan and wasn't in the previous uh, consultation. We have some experience of how the plan might work, you could argue, because we recently installed a cable between the mainland and Jura, and that wasn't without its difficulties. And as far as we could see, the plan was being adopted at that point, and that caused us a lot of difficulties. We've essentially got three issues to, to bring to the committee. <clears throat> One is that we feel Chapter 14 is new, it hasn't been consulted upon, certainly in relation to distribution cables, and that needs to be done before the policy is put before Parliament, in our view. We also believe the plan should reflect the overarching principles of the existing UK Marine Plan. We believe it needs to be evidence-based, risk-assessed, and proportionate, and it certainly needs to take account, or proper account, of distribution electricity cables. And the third thing we absolutely need to do, and it comes out of the, the mainland Jura experience, is it needs to address the specific issue of faulty cables. We absolutely need to address that within the plan, and that's not there at the moment. Well, we'll certainly have a chance to discuss cables specifically uh, a little later on, but thanks for raising that. Um, uh, Richard Ballantyne. Thank you. Yes, I'll broadly echo previous comments. We, we very much welcome this document and welcome the interaction we have with Marine Scotland taking on board the port's views. Um, it does set the context against which planning decisions will be made in the future. And I, I guess the main issue we have is, is going on is how regional plans will reflect that and how they will follow on from this. Um, and we hope they very much do. And Annie. Peter. And yes, I mean, we also welcome the plan. Um, I mean, generally it provides um, a good vision for Scotland's seas. Um, for us, it provides um, a sort of clear framework in which we can undertake um, our leasing activities. Generally, um, our, our objectives are very much aligned with the plan, and so um, it, it makes our leasing decisions easier and provides the framework for that, particularly in terms of renewable energy, where there are the um, spatial areas identified. Thank you. I'm not expecting you all to answer every section. I did bring you all in at the beginning because I think it's important to bear in mind that question. What difference will this make to your sector as we're going through the, the questions just now? So the first one uh, is about, uh, particularly about COSLA issues. Graham Day. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning. Um, 
Because I have raised concerns um, along the lines that ministers would be able to overrule the decisions and representations of planning authorities, um, and whether there would be potential conflict between the National Marine Plan and local marine plans when they are developed, I'm just wondering uh, whether you share those concerns in any way. Bertie Armstrong, then Phil Thomas. Yes, Graham, indeed. Um, in, in, in fact, the, the issue is, is even slightly um, broader than that, in that it, it's not clear to uh, us in the fishing industry how the regional areas will actually go about their business and who, comprise, who will comprise the, the, the committees, councils or, or, or other forums that, that, that make up the planners. Um, and how they will go about their work and more importantly what, what authority they will have to institute it. Our, our experience um, with inshore fisheries groups which are, are a, a microcosm if you like of that sort of thing has, not, has, has been less than perfect. So, so I think there is a, a systemic difficulty um, with local planning in that it will vary wildly from area to area. Shetland will be different from the Western Isles will be wildly different from the Firth of Forth etc. Um, so, so, so we do have a concern um, about the coherence of plans um, and, and, and it's much more basic than, than, than a concern that, that ministers may overrule. Can I sort of broaden that out slightly then in terms of the, the original question? Do the panel believe that all the relevant local authorities will have the necessary experience, expertise to take on the duties they're going to inherit from this? Phil and then uh, Annie. In response directly to that, that question, the answer is no. Um, I think there is not a, a prospect at the moment. Um, I think from an aquaculture standpoint, there are, there are two concerns. I firstly reiterate the points that Bertie's made, that the notion that the regional bodies, as it were, that are brought together will instantly work and, and to be, become fully functional, I think is, is slightly naive. I think there's now an additional complication because the recommendations from the Smith Commission have changed, potentially at least, the role of the Crown Estate or the, the functions of the Crown Estate in relation to local authorities. So suddenly you would have a situation for aquaculture uh, and, and uh, other inshore uh, elements where the local authority would become both the proprietor of the seabed and the planning authority. So there are, there are governance issues there that I think uh, are new and, and not considered at all as yet. Um, and I think the nightmare scenario uh, for the aquaculture sector is that we spent the best part of 10 years trying to get local authorities, since, since local authority planning has come in, uh, really local authorities to have their planning on a consistent basis between local authority planning areas. There's a real concern from the industry that the new arrangements might actually take that in completely the opposite direction that you might find very localised policies in each area, which may be great for local democracy, uh, but for uh, development in a general national sense, really make, make life very difficult. So I think there are real problems there. Mm. Adi Beam. Um, yes, I mean, the updated version of the plan provides a lot more detail about what um, is going to be expected of regional marine planning partnerships, which is good in a lot of respects and is something that we did ask for in our original consultation response. However, it then provides the detail about you know, some of these elements like um, the planning partnerships will be expected to refine the option areas for renewable energy. And I, I don't see that the local authorities or um, planning partnerships would all have access to really the technical expertise needed for that. And so um, I mean, also, not just renewable energy, but there's uh, talk about the planning partnerships identifying um, strategic cable corridors and, um, you know, areas for, you know, which might be suitable for commercialisation of CCS projects. Um, and I think really, these, a lot of these are quite strategic issues and will go beyond 12 nautical miles as well. And how the join-up between these strategic issues going beyond 12 nautical miles and the planning partnerships um, needs some careful thought, but also 
Scottish Government through Marine Scotland, I think, really need to ensure that the um, planning partnerships have enough resource and enough expertise to actually be able to deliver what the plan currently sets out for them to do. Thanks, I think that's a very good point you make there because on committee we tend to ask the difficult questions, you identify the problems, we very rarely get solutions to these difficulties. So let me ask another question, what do you think needs to be done to ensure we can overcome these difficulties? Phil Thomas. This is almost a recitation of history in some ways, Graham. If you look uh, at the published documents. There are two documents that are uh, that go under the title of something like improved uh, planning for aquaculture development. Uh, and these were developed over the last five or six years. And this was started by an initiative from the industry to try to say to the local authorities, if you're going to get involved in aquaculture planning in a serious way, then you need to get the right level of expertise and therefore there's a very strong argument for local authorities actually coming together to set up some sort of strategic unit that would have all that expertise. Now in practice, uh, I'm afraid uh, the industry didn't probably read the local authority politics well enough on that because all the local authorities recognized the need to get the expertise. They probably didn't fully accept the need to come together with that expertise. Uh, but we have made some progress and there's a, gr a much greater sharing between local authorities than there was historically. But I think the solution to the problem would be that you would need some sort of uh, unit that ran across local authorities that did have the expertise to do that kind of work. That might well lead into the next question, but uh, uh, Richard. Yeah, just to follow up, really, I share both these concerns. Uh, from the port sector, uh, some local authorities actually own and manage ports, so they may be a bit better place to to deal with planning decisions related to ports, not necessarily other decisions. Um, and these new partnerships do become a new statutory consultee on marine licence applications. In, in my sector's case, that's for things like dredging and disposal licences, which could be contentious, may not be. Um, and just on, on, the, on your question about how you would solve this or attempt to solve this and resourcing, I mean, perhaps one option is to have some kind of central person, team, at Marine Scotland, bringing it all together as a, as a sort of a strategy, ensuring that local partnerships have a kind of central national support to, to fall on, so they're not just left to, to do it without any sort of uh, central support. And uh, Lucy Greenhill. Uh, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think there needs to be um, some greater clarity about the ongoing role of Marine Scotland as that central body in the process. And I know from, from some discussions that is actually happening and hopefully at the same time as the, the final National Marine Plan is, is published, I think there will be some um, guidelines, there's some early guidelines being drafted for the regional marine pl planning partnerships to take forward that's based on the experience of um, Shetland and the Clyde, which are obviously the, the furthest ahead. But my concern would be is that they, they have a quite a particular situation, well Shetland um, in particular with their own um, local um, planning powers that they have there, but the resources across the other regions like in Argyle where I'm based for example and, and in the Highlands areas, I don't think, I think they would struggle to replicate what they have. And I think the other point is that there seems to be quite a lot of emphasis on getting the region marine planning partnerships up, up and running and they are all defined and then off they go and do the marine planning. But I think there's a danger that if, if too many of those strings are let go centrally that we kind of lose a lot of the um, potential for marine planning to really succeed at a national level. So I was certainly keen that there was some real definitive principles set out by Marine Scotland that kind of provided that skeleton framework around which the rest of these re regional marine plans would fit. And I'm thinking, thinking of things that make sense at a national level, so it is things like reporting on environmental conditions on, on my site, so things like marine mammals that are protected at a, a population national level. Um, these kind of things need to be held together centrally for it to be resource efficient and effective. Callum Duncan and then uh, Mike Russell. Good to come in. Yeah, um, I've just come back on Lucy's last point because I agree with that, the importance of that sort of central oversight and that's, that's the value of the National Marine Plan 
providing that framework and providing a, a clear steer, bringing it back to the, to the local level. I think we'd all agree around the table we want to, you know, we want to see evidence-based adaptive decision making. We want to see effective stakeholder participation. Um, so for, for marine planning to work at a regional level, it has to be effectively uh, resourced and uh, that, that's a, probably a continual plea from all sectors, but it's an investment um, because if you've got skilled planners uh, delivering ecosystem and facilitating ecosystem-based planning locally, um, including looking at the scope for enhancing the health of local areas in, in environmental terms and improving the goods and services in terms of coastal protection, uh, nutrient cycling, uh, locking up carbon, food provision, all the things that, that flow from properly looking after uh, regional areas of sea and seabed, then uh, you know, the wider society and, and local economy stands to benefit from that. So um, that's why we were slightly disappointed that the National Marine Plan doesn't provide a bit more guidance to uh, regional planners and that links to the concern about the scope for enhancement. Um, the, the plan could, we were disappointed it didn't include a general policy on um, uh, encouraging sustainable development and marine activities which provide protection and enhancement opportunities and they, there could also be a greater steer to uh, regional planners being able to uh, take opportunities to enhance the health of their local plan, to look at the different types of seabed that they have there and the benefits that they provide instead of looking at cons conservation as a constraint but looking at the opportunities there for, for enhancing the services those, those um, habitats provide. And so greater uh, resources for local planning is an investment that everybody stands to benefit from. I, I, I should bring in Mike Russell at this stage because it follows on from it because last time he was suggesting the exact opposite. There was a danger of becoming a little too specific uh, in, uh, about local activities in the National Marine Plan, indeed that uh, a cat's cradle of regulation and guidance. More regulation and guidance as far as I can see within the document. I'm, can I follow up Callum's point because I think it arises from it. Um, it. It does seem to me that in the best of all possible worlds there would be this group of enlightened regional marine planners who were within all the relevant local authorities who were, in your own words, Callum, highly skilled and ready and able to bring forward detailed um, local and regional marine plans that involved all the stakeholders. That's not going to happen. There isn't the resourcing for local government. Those people do not exist in the local authorities that, uh, that are involved. And we have in the national document, in my own view, and it's actually borne out in quite a lot of the evidence and even some of the remarks here, a curious conflict between some very detailed and prescriptive actions, for example, on cables, and some very vague um, aspirations in other areas which don't actually give us much policy guidance. Now, Lucy, your point about key principles is something I'd like to get back to. And I raised this with the officials at the meeting before Christmas. And I'd just like some reaction from individuals around the table to this point. If this document were couched in terms of key principles that were to be observed in marine activity by all the stakeholders, including, I have to say, uh, and I think whilst the tone perhaps of some of the evidence from uh, yourself was less than helpful, the content, some of the content was quite useful. Um, a commitment, for example, to fishing as a, an activity, a key activity, and sustainable fisheries as a key activity, um, and other commitments. And then an encouragement to apply those principles locally uh, in, within the existing framework of regulation, because there is a substantial existing framework of le legislation. And it's difficult to see often when you read this document where the links are between this document and the existing regulation. Again, Bertie's submission makes a point that there is a whole range of, act of, of regulation that governs fishing. I don't see where that fits in to some of the issues in the National Marine Plan. So I'd just like a reaction to a document that might become something other than it is, which is a declaration of clear principles, which are then applied on a regional basis by by Marine Scotland staff working regionally and 
local authority planners, although I do have concerns about the capability of local authorities, and particularly the key local authorities here, in being able to take this forward at a time when local government is under pressure and resources are very tight. So, Bertie Armstrong first. Thank you very much. Uh, two apologies. One, I keep referring to you as chairman. I'll stop that right away, Mr. Convener. I beg your pardon. Um, um, yeah, uh, the tone. I accept that. Uh, your worst, one's worst problem is one's worst problem, and one expresses it in such terms. And I'm very glad that the content that didn't put off anybody reading the rest of it. The editor is always useful. <laughs> You're right. Um, I would wish to reiterate that point. This is, this is really significant uh, um, that, that um, f in, the, in the matter of fishing, there is a cat's cradle of regulation emanating from Europe and across the, the continental shelf, which looks after us. If we have local distortions and interferences, then uh, um, that will create difficulties and we'll be fighting basically on, on, on two fronts. It's not to avoid regulation, it's to have one coherent system. Um, the, 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 the other point that I think has come out in, in the last two submissions is the, um, the matter of scale. It, you, you will not repair uh, uh, very much by concentrating on a few acres of this or that or, 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 or the other, which is why it's very important to have overarching uh, policy rather than uh, regional policy. And we do remain very much um, frightened uh, uh, of the potential for lack of expertise. We've seen it uh, uh, time and time again in, in things like the, the coastal forums that exist and in the IFGs where with the best intention, if you say to a group of people in a very regional area, make a plan for you, they will say, I want his, his and his stuff because he's not from my area and I want him to stay away from me to... Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 very, gen uh, very badly generalize on that, but that is the danger of not having uh, expertise everywhere. We need to be realistic, as you pointed out, and we need to remember that the scale of this ought to be on the National Marine Plan, because it's not a very big country anyway, uh, 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 before we start uh, dividing it up into eight. Thank you. Uh, Callum Duncan, then uh, Lucy Greenhill. Um, just on Mike's point about expertise and resources, I mean, I think as Lucy said, Shetland provides a very good example, and there might be special reasons why Shetland was better resourced there. But we can look to that as a good example of ecosystem-based planning. So we, we should also look at the potential for training, because often this, the, these matters needn't be that difficult. It might be the simple basis of enlightening local planners and decision makers as to what is under the water. And, you know, um, presentations can be provided and training can be provided and there should be opportunities looked at there. Um, just on the evidence base, I'm, I'm a fan of evidence based policy making and so are you. <coughs> just on the evidence base, right, where is the optimism that the resource exists to replicate what has happened in Shetland, which has been largely successful, in the other local authorities are going to be greatly affected, you know, my own local authority and others. I just don't think, given this, the pressure on local authority resources, there is any sign of that happening. There's no evidence that's happening. Indeed, existing planning departments with their present workload are suffering as a result, for example, the increase in applications for renewables. I'm not against it. I just think the evidence does not support your admirable optimism. Well, you know, we, we can set our aspirations here in terms of what opportunities might be coming down the line from, um, you know, any changes in governance as well that, that might provide resourcing opportunities. Um, but I, I might say Argyle provides a good example with the expertise that you have there in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the SAC um, project officer working at the local authority. Um, the, I just want to very quickly take the opportunity as well to, to, to flag a concern about, you're, you're talking about the cat's cradle, um, this sort of tension between policies and local detail and uh, you know, wider strategic points. And it's, just to take the opportunity to, to log the concern to the committee, 
uh, as to the actual strategic environment assessment process of this plan, because we're aware that the, there was an addendum to the sustainability appraisal that was lodged after the last evidence session, which doesn't reference how it relates to the strategic environment assessment process. So we don't think the SEA has delivered in terms of influencing the plans, and we're concerned about, and it links to the point about regional marine planning and, and the links to centralised oversight from government, we're not aware of any avenues for holding planners to account um, uh, arising from uh, the, the sustainability um, appraisal process. So it, it's just to flag that that's something that the committee might want to raise uh, with, with the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. Uh, Lucy Greenhill, and then we'll come back to Dave with a supplementary. No, he doesn't want a supplementary. He'll get back in soon enough. I just wanted to add one brief element to this idea of principles at a central level, and that's actually how they could help set out how we measure performance and success of the marine planning process as well. Because at the minute, it doesn't, although it's set out to be an adaptive management process, the framework by which that's actually reported and dealt with and developed and determined to be effective um, isn't yet clear. And you really you'd struggle to develop that at a regional scale. That needs to be set around this idea of the core principles and objectives of what the marine planning process is for. Okay, fine, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we've kind of looked at some of the principles and practice. Uh, we need to look at some uh, of these general principles, particularly, first of all, in natural heritage and then in adaptive management. And uh, Claudia Beamish is going to lead off on this one. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to uh, everyone who's here. Um, I'd like to turn our minds uh, to um, General Planning Principle Gen 9 on natural heritage, which Callum Duncan has touched on already, and on um, Gen 20 on adaptive management. Um, and stakeholders in evidence have expressed concern that some of the um, general planning principles, um, about some of the general planning principles, and in their briefing, uh, Scottish Environment Link focused on um, Gen 9. Um, and uh, just for clarification for those that may not have the, the copy with them, um, Gen 9 states, and I quote, development and use of the marine environment must A, comply with legal requirements for protected areas and protected species, B, not result in significant impact on the national status of priority marine features and C, protect and where appropriate, um, and I'm not quite sure whether this is in bold in the actual document or whether it's been in bold in my notes, but it is very important, enhance the health of the marine area. It says in brackets, sorry, bold added. Um, so in written evidence as well on Gen 20, um, Scottish Renewables, um, who aren't giving evidence today but have given written evidence, have stated, and I again quote, that ad hoc amendments to the plan in light of new data would create uncertainty, resulting in greater risks for project development and therefore would not be supported. Um, so one or two uh, people on the, on the round table today have already highlighted the issue of adaptive management. So if we could look, please, both now at, at the um, development and use of the marine environment from the natural heritage perspective and also the adaptive management uh, issue and whether the people here today think that the, these set the right tone um, in, in, um, in the marine plan draft as it stands at the moment. Thank you. We're talking about the, the correct tone here, I think, you know, particularly uh, it's been suggested. Phil Thomas, yeah? yeah um, on a general principle, I think the idea of setting out the principles and the evidence and, and, and science-based management approach at the beginning was good. Uh, for me, the document as it went on was slightly disappointing in the sense that some of those principles uh, got lost, or at least the tone, if, if I can use that term, uh, of the, the, the later document was not as clear as the tone of the first document. I think on the specific point that Claude has raised, <coughs> I think there is an issue because almost anything that you wish to consider as being a development in the marine environment requires substantial investment. 
And therefore, if anything is going to happen in terms of development, you have to have a framework and a structure that gives investors in every sector, investors uh, a confidence, as it were, that there is some stability about the investment. So I think getting the tone right and making sure that in terms of adaptive management, you don't have a continuously moving platform is actually a serious consideration. Because, to be frank, there are lots of other people at other places in the world that people can invest in. Uh, we, we need to attract investment to Scotland. So getting those tone and, and consistency elements sufficiently um, firmed up, as it were, I think is important. David Levin, could I bring you in at this point? Because I think about offshore marine uh, developments that uh, can learn from some of the things that have changed in the rules for the development of onshore uh, re renewable developments. And I wonder whether adaptive management is something that needs to be much better spelled out. Um, I mean, I think we're considering this at two levels. Um, I mean, to have certainty at the strategic level is very important. Um, but also we need flexibility um, the, 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 in, in terms of adaptive management for the environment. You need that, but also from a, a commercial perspective, you need that too. So there's a, a, a different balance to be struck at the detailed level, I believe. Um, I mean, I can't talk on behalf of the renewables industry. Scottish Renewables have done, um, and I would defer to their comments, to be honest, in relation to um, the, the point that Claudia introduced. Anyone else want to comment on this just now? Uh, first of all, uh, Annie Breeden. I mean, I think in terms of um, changing areas potentially that have been identified in the plan for renewables, as more evidence um, emerges, I think, as Phil has said, could be very damaging to industry once you've identified areas to then take them away. Um, it just creates a completely sort of unacceptable risk, really. But I think there's opportunities in terms of where there's um, the refinement of the option areas, you know, the plan states that the, the whole of these plan option areas is not expected to be developed. So I think where new evidence is emerging about um, impacts from offshore wind, wave and tide, that that's the opportunity to feed it into when you're refining those option areas um, and to, to not take this new evidence that will emerge sort of over the next couple of years as projects are um, deployed would be sort of irresponsible really but there needs to be a clear framework in terms of how that's going to be done so the industry really understands the process for that and it isn't just done in, a, in an ad hoc manner. As a developer, David, uh, Alan Broadbent, do you have a view on this? Well, funnily enough, I'm not a developer in, in, in this context, uh, convener. We, we've got 111 separate cables that aren't going to expand at all. What we want to do is replace them efficiently, uh, uh, repair faults efficiently, and keep the customers who are connected to those cables on supply securely and at least cost. That, that's what our issue is. I'm not part of the renewable side, so I can't comment. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Richard. Uh, thank you. Just, um, uh, just say... I guess on adaptive management, I mean, does it go both ways? Can we, you know, does it balance the environmental protection side with development, sustainable development? That's, that's just the point. I suppose a question for Marine Scotland. So uh, flexibility. So you put that on the table and it's something we can raise, obviously, yeah. with the Cabinet Secretary. Claudia Beamish. Right. Uh, thank you, Gavina. Uh, uh, can I just push those who are involved with responsibilities for development on the um, natural heritage side to, to comment on this, as well as any... Uh, any comments that anyone around the table um, has specifically at this point um, on the issue of climate change um, and whether the tone of that is appropriate um, looking to the future because I actually see that the Salmon Fish Association of Salmon Fisheries Boards and their evidence who aren't represented today say that um, there isn't any comment on um, uh, the effects of climate change on salmonoid fish um, within the marine environment, although there is within the um, freshwater life cycle part of, of the salmon's life. So I wonder if there are um, comments from developers about um, Gen 9 and the natural heritage and protection and enhancement of our marine environment, and also any comments on climate change. Lucy Greenhill. Sorry, I'm, I'm not a developer, but I was going to no, make please. a few comments <laughs> anyway. Um, on the climate change side of things, that, uh, um, something that we raised 
uh, was that there seems to be a poor balance between adaptation to climate change and mitigation of climate change. Sometimes that seemed a bit disproportionate to me, particularly, and Callum mentioned this, the oil and gas sector. There was a lot of emphasis on climate change adaptation, so ad adapt making sure that your oil rig isn't susceptible to rising sea levels. But then there was an unequal emphasis on actually how we manage and assess the, the the realities of the effects that oil and gas would have on climate change ultimately so that and actually the problem that raises and it's an opportunity for marine planning to address is the need to look at the different temporal scales at which effects are elicited on the environment where it is at the protected area species level or where it is at a climate change level because at the minute the yeah, the, the way that things are legislated and decisions and consenting are done at the minute there's a real difficulty in offsetting and making decisions on those different relative scales of impacts. I think. So some, yeah, so some clarity about how we balance ticking those boxes of complying protected areas and PMFs and those kind of things against those wider benefits of projects such as renewable energy which obviously mitigate climate change at a broader scale would be beneficial I think. Calm Duncan then uh, Bertie Armstrong. Um, thank you. Just to respond to Claudia's first point as well, um, uh, in relation to Gen 9, uh, it, it's an opportunity just to, to flag, that's quite a good example of what we see as lack of ambition, because in relation to priority marine features, um, you know, which are important species and habitats wherever they're found, the, the policy applying across the plan is to not result in significant impact on the so it's this very sort of constraining language rather than looking for opportunities to enhance the health of or the extent of and, and thereby recognizing the links to the benefits that they provide. Um, but to, to bring it back to a specific point about adaptive management, we, um, we welcome adaptive management, learning by doing, but decisions have to be made on, on the best information available. Um, and uh, you know, the, uh, the Argyle Array was quite an interesting example where uh, with, with even more information available, you know, th there might have been less risk to um, developer confidence and investment. Uh, and that's not to be critical of the process. You know, we don't live in a perfect world. It's just to flag that it, it's... Um, uh, having that proper environmental understanding, which will never be absolutely complete, is, is, is very important because that leads to good business as well. And, and I think, um, you know, our girl Array was one example of that. And if I could jump quickly to the sentence prior to Gen 20, which is linked to adaptive management, um, and the, the word balance has been used a little bit. It says the precautions taken, this is in relation to sound evidence, should be considered based on risk by balancing environmental, social, and economic costs and benefits. And, um, you know, adaptive management learning by doing should be uh, uh, on, the, on the basis of starting from a more precautionary pr basis because we don't know uh, enough about uh, the impacts often and the cumulative impacts. So we don't think it's appropriate to be talking about balancing unknown risks in, in the context of the precautionary principle. By definition, the precautionary principle, we have to be um, precautionary on, on environmental grounds first because that is the envelope in which all the other activity happens. Just before you go on, just Sorry. To, un to underline <laughs> yeah. this, and it may mean you don't need to go on. In Gen 9, it says development and use of marine environment must protect and, where appropriate, enhance the health of the marine area. It's equally important with the other points in that general statement. So uh, is the question as relevant as, uh, uh, as Claudia thought? You know, it is part of the envelope, absolutely. But it states there quite categorically that that must be taken into account. I mean, perhaps it's a, a, a tone thing and it, it might sound like splitting hairs, but we, we, we think it's appropriate because the, the plan doesn't also link um, explicitly, for example, to the Scottish biodiversity strategy. And there's also a biodiversity duty uh, for bodies to further, the, um, further biodiversity. So, you know, there, there's, there's, 
I think it's incumbent on me to raise those concerns about the degree to which the plan meets those okay. legal tests, particularly in the absence of a clear strategic environment assessment process, as I flagged earlier. Okay. Uh, fight, uh, Bertie Armstrong just now on this one. Before Thank we you, move just on to some more science. Just a very brief uh, um, um, reaction to that. We um, take comfort from Gen 20 um, in, in the terms of, of Gen 9 because uh, as users of the marine environment presently and that uh, adaptive management practices could take account um, of new data. For instance, if we find that cumulative displacement um, of fishing is creating a local problem for someone. Uh, um, um, you can't just always fish somewhere else, depending on size, particularly for small-scale inshore fisheries. If you're displaced, you're displaced, and you're gone. Um, so, so, so the use in the sentence before, just to pick up on Callum's point, um, of balancing uh, social and economic costs and benefits in a local area is, is really very important. And at this point, there's always a ritual statement um, of, from the Scottish Fishermen's Federation about, about um, the, the precautionary basis. Precaution is necessary. It needs to be evidence-based, and it needs to take sense, because if you were to be precautionary about deaths on the road, you would shut down road transport, and, of course, we simply can't do that. It's the same in the seabed. You need to take some degree of risk here and there, not to play fast and loose with the environment, but to be sensible about a precautionary approach. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Can I just come back yep. Ask if um, uh, Phil Thomas might comment on, on the, the Gen 9 in terms of enhancement in view of the fact that um, we are going to come to aquaculture more broadly lately, but later, but it would be helpful, I think, at this point just to have something on the record for the report of, of um, the, the view of the industry on, on that. I, I don't think we would have too much difficulty with the wording of, of, of uh, nine. And indeed, one of the things that has recently uh, happened uh, is that the European Union has been trying to look at the, the application of the precautionary principle across marine development generally and aquaculture in particular. And what emerges from that uh, in Scotland, for example, is there are a number of aquaculture developments in areas that were later designated as SACs or, or uh, in some other way, uh, and that there essentially is no conflict. So I think the industry is already in a situation where uh, the, the, the need to avoid particular natural heritage site is built into the planning process and is accepted. Uh, but actually, rather comfortingly, where there are sensitive areas where the industry was already established, on the basis of what we've been able to see, there is no adverse impact there, which is actually quite encouraging. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, on the general side, oh, Lucy uh, Greenhill on this point. Please. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to raise the question of the role of marine planning in the licensing and the decision making process because I think when we talk about adaptive management there's perhaps some different um, interpretations of what, what we're actually meaning when we talk about but there's obviously the plan level adaptive management is looking at how effective the marine planning process is and adapting that approach but from a developers and consenting um, perspective adaptive management is much more about the licensing body making a decision in the face of some uncertainty but then adapting that planned development as we learn from monitoring etc that's done at that site about that particular development but that decision to move forward with that risk-based approach as you were discussing is very much the regulators um, prerogative it's their it's their responsibility to do that and I'm just wondering how the marine planning process and that framework really fits against the, the decision-making process and the responsibilities that the government has um, on, whether, on how much risk to, to deal with in adaptive management strategies. Right, thank you for that. Food for thought. Uh, sound science, we're kind of into that area, I think. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Yes, uh, Callum Duncan's already mentioned um, General Policy 19 on sound science, uh, which states that uh, decision making in the marine environment will be based on sound scientific and socio economic evidence. Um, now, we've seen um, from the Scottish Salmon Producers uh, Organisation submission 
uh, that they are questioning whether a consistent evidence-based approach is maintained uh, throughout the National Marine Plan. Um, and, however, Scottish Environment Link have concerns arguing that balancing economic, social and environmental concerns is difficult if there is little evidence or science on environmental impacts in an activity. Um, can I ask panel members if you are content with the general policy A19 on the use of sound science and would you say that sound science and evidence based policy making is used consistently and appropriately throughout the National Marine Plan? Who is first? I, I can respond specifically on the, the issue that um, I think is raised in our uh, response. Uh, which, curiously enough, is not really a salmon producers issue. It's, it's an aquaculture issue generally. Yeah. There has been a, a long-standing presumption against planning development for the north and east coast based on a very precautionary uh, position in regard to salmon farming in particular. Uh, and it was made coming out of the uh, Nixon report in 1997 when there was no evidence of any sort at all. Now, we haven't argued that that position should be shifted uh, in relation to salmon farming, although, in truth, we would question the, the, the uh, basis on which it is made at the moment. But the thing that we find quite extraordinary is that it's been extended to all other forms of fish farming. Uh, and, and we, on a scientific basis, can see no evidence at all that the, the, the logic with salmon farming is that because you're farming the same species, you, you have potential interactions between the farm species and the non-farm species. The logic of extrapolating that to all other forms of farm species seems quite extraordinary. Uh, and if you take the um, amendments report, uh, and I think we've quoted the wording for that as well, that basically says, well, we, we shouldn't change it because we don't know if there are any effects. Well, the reality is that we really don't know if there are any effects from uh, wind development or alternative energy or indeed shell shift fish farm if it came to that. Um, you know, if you, you operate on the basis that you say where the no evidence is available, then you do nothing. The reality is you always do nothing. And that seems to be a perverse situation. So that's the point that we've been concerned about. And any others on this just now? Bertie Armstrong. Yeah. Briefly, uh, it, it goes without saying that sound science underpins the, um, any, any address of the problems of stock health. Um, um, and the observation that we make is there's never enough money in the world, there's never going to be enough money in the world to, to, to uh, do all the science that we would like um, and that we are trying our, our, our best, both I think in the fish farming industry and certainly in, in the wild capture industry, um, to contribute as much as we possibly can for, out of self-interest, of course, to, um, to uh, contributing to the science base. But it's always going to have to be, uh, um, um, it, it'll never be completely adequate, and we're very glad to see in Gen 19 um, the, the socioeconomic evidence part of that as well. Okay. okay. And uh, we've got Richard and then Lucy. Yeah, just, uh, just a very quick point, actually. The, um, I've just come back to uh, in the beginning of the Chapter 4, Paragraph 4.3, the presumption of in favour of sustainable development use is presented as an overarching general planning principle of the plan. So that's guiding the whole thing. So I'll just kind of draw things back to that, but just a quick point. Okay. Thank you. Lucy, three now. Yeah, I just wanted to mention briefly that as a general principle, and it is sound that, yeah, indeed it should be based on sound science, but from experience of consent in offshore wind farms in particular, there isn't enough science and there will never be enough money. So what you're dealing with is a huge amount of uncertainty in the planning and decision making process. And, and I, I would share the concern that actually that comes down very much to the bodies and the people involved in that process. And that is something that could definitely go off in, and be interpreted differently at a regional scale. And it would be an example, I think, of something that needs to be managed much more centrally. And I know this is something that Marine Scotland are thinking about and developing approaches for dealing with uncertainty and risk. Um, but I would make that much more um, clear in the, in the National Marine Plan. And if I could just add one point also, Another recommendation that comes out of this that needs to be handled at a central level is how science um, is 
the, the objectives of science and the science research is coordinated centrally to ensure that the, the building up of that sound science evidence base is done in a, a resource effective and efficient way. Thank you for that. Um, we should try and move on to uh, National Marine Plan Interactive. Jim Hume. So, thank, thank you very much, uh, convener. Uh, yes, so the National Marine Plan uh, Interactive, uh, there was evidence uh, from some here that uh, they felt that there were some issues and, and things that were not mapped. I would just like to see uh, what the, some of our guests here today think uh, uh, regarding the National M Marine Plan Interactive uh, and if there are any things on it that are not mapped that should be mapped and if so, why? Yes, Lucy Greenhill. Just shut me up if I'm talking too much. But, um, I would just link that to Annie's point about um, the regional marine plan planners potentially needing to refine plan options at a regional level because what they need is the fun functionality that the Crown Estate had and the Scottish Government use in the Mars system. And a concern that Annie mentioned was that if they don't have that kind of functionality, which the National Marine Plan Interactive doesn't at the minute, then they would struggle to replicate um, the quality of planning that would be undertaken at a national level. They'd, yeah, they'd struggle to improve that at a regional basis, I think. Mm -hmm. Any other points there? Yes, Phil Thomas. Uh, a development of that kind of same point that in reality you never have enough information. And I think the most frustrating thing for a developer uh, is when, usually in relation to natural heritage, to be frank, um, there is the identification that there is a potential natural heritage, heritage interaction. And the, the, the developer is asked to comment on that. And the people the developer would normally ask for the information would be Scottish natural heritage, but actually it's Scottish, Scottish natural heritage that is asking the question. So you get into these kind of cyclic, uh, discussions about something that is, is based on the fact that there simply is not enough information. And uh, if I could take a specific point to illustrate, it happens quite frequently in relation to bird colonies, for example, where there is a threat to uh, potentially a threat of mortality to a relatively few birds. And, and the question that comes up time and time again is how much is a significant threat? which actually requires you to have some knowledge of the dynamics of the population that you're talking about in terms of uh, reproduction and so on and so forth. And most of that data is not available. Mike Russell. Lucy's point and Phil's point would seem to, uh, and Lucy's earlier point about the need for a national approach to the science, which I think is absolutely true. Uh, there obviously needs to be a national approach to, to to data and mapping data so that there is one single authoritative source. What we seem to be hearing around the table is that that doesn't exist or are we hearing, and I really don't know the answer to this so I'm looking for some information, are we hearing that there are a number of sources, some of which are better than others, and the danger will be that people are not using the best source? What is the situation? To, to answer that point, well, Annie Breeden uh, just I mean, I think to pick up um, what Lucy was saying, if I understand it rightly, is um, more to do with um, actual scientific data that was used to inform um, the selection of the sort of plan option areas rather than um, sort of wider spatial data. Um, but that... that information that we have, um, the system that Lucy was referring to, our Mars system, which is essentially a sort of sophisticated GIS tool which um, can, um, you put in a lot of different sort of environmental, technical and other considerations in order to identify um, offshore energy projects. Um, so that, that, that um, system is shared with Moon Scotland when they need to use it. Um, and I mean, in due course, um, I mean, in due course, it could be made available in some way to I mean planning partnerships. It's not there's obviously um, the transfer of Crown State going on, so I, I can't comment on how that would actually work in reality in the future. 
um, but certainly where necessary we make, um, or where we can, we make that information available. But if you've got, you know, I just want to press this point a bit with whoever is willing to answer it. You know, if we've got the requirement for date, first class data and first class science, one can't make an absolute distinction, but we, if we've got the requirement for both of those things uh, as an imperative for decision making uh, by local authorities and by developers and by existing users, then surely we do need to have a first class resource to access. And if that first class resource is not Na um, National Marine Plan Interactive or whatever it's called, what is it? It would seem very foolish to go down this road without that information immediately to hand. I mean, I, you know, it goes far as to say I don't think you should go down this road <laughs> until that information is to hand. Would people agree? And if so, what should we do? Lucy Greenhill first. The, the data management side. So I think it's really positive that Marine Scotland are now making the National Marine Plan interactive available for use for the Regional Marine Plan in partnerships because at least they will be using the same tool because there was a risk initially that they would just have to go off and develop their own tools. And that also through in discussions with that, they are developing... Um, well, the, the first thing, exercise that's happening now is that the Regional Marine Plan in partnerships are starting to pool their data International Marine Plan Interactive, or they're going through that process, which is a kind of a follow-up to the, I've forgotten the name of the document, not chart in progress, but the Scotland Marine Atlas. So they're going through that process again, and they're having discussions about how to manage the quality of the data that goes into that central resource. So the idea of a central repository is there. Um, the question that, that I had was that we went through this process of gathering national data to enable strategic planning for, for SEAs and for renewable energy. And the Crown Estate and their Mars tool came up with the best tool um, that was available to do that in terms of the data that it held and the, fun the functionality that it has, which is why the Scottish Government started to use that for their own planning purposes. And I, and I would share the concern that I, I don't... It would be best if that tool was the one that was then shared for use locally rather than National Marine Plan, which I think is National Marine Plan Interactive, which I think is a much more slimmed down version of it and compromises your ability to do planning in a similar sort of way that has been done so far. Richard and then Callum. I agree with, uh, thank you, Camille. I agree with Nike's uh, concerns. And I guess the, the issue, we go back to the original points we were talking about first of all is a strong, what do you call it, project management of Marine Scotland. They have to take the lead and get something centrally done and looking at what the best sources are. We have, um, coming back to your question, on, on, on what data is there, we have, um, we've had an email recently, the, this is the port sector from Marine Scotland, looking just to confirm where the statutory port limits of the major ports are, just to make sure they're right, because I think some of them, not, not the fall of Marine Scotland, it just goes back through history. The kind of, you know, finding out exactly where they are, and if that's a problem all around Scotland, mm. there's over, I think there's got sort of 200 or so statutory harbour authorities around Scotland, so if each of those are slightly wrong, <laughs> do, are they going to be affected, that, that kind of thing. So, I mean, there is evidence that Marine Scotland are, on, are, are getting on top of certain things, so that is good, but I suppose it's the, the question for the committee is for Marine Scotland to take a strong lead on collating these sort of, mm. using these sources. Just in order to add a layer to the... Uh, complexity of this question. Uh, bring in Graham here to uh, supplement it, I think, specifically on that point. Absolutely, Kimbia. Thank you for that. You know, Lucy made reference to the Marine Atlas, and if I recall correctly, it included the shipping lanes, for example, which showed you know, where, where the ships were, and that impacted on where they would allow uh, offshore renewable developments. And it does strike me from the evidence that we've received in writing that it's strange that commercial anchorages and navigational approaches aren't um, part of this. I, w I would have thought that was a fairly obvious thing to have included. Yes, well, I mean, that's one of the points one of our members actually, or several of our members made in the response to the committee. But that, that is, I mean, there's some reference in, in the document, but perhaps not enough. So you're absolutely right. That's a, a good point to raise. Surely they require to be protected. Absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's something that, the, as I say, members of raised. We haven't done that because we didn't do a response. Yeah. <laughs> but no, we agree completely. But to get that on the record, that isn't yeah. it? You, you yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. It yeah. forms part of this. Thank you. So in the context of making complete uh, information a central point, which is what Mike was thrusting at, you know, uh, can we focus upon that, just sort of try and uh, get to that point, which then gives... 
uh, Jim Hume some uh, comfort that this interactive approach is actually going to be of value. Uh, Callum Duncan, first of all, then Phil Thomas. Uh, we obviously want planning to be based on as um, fine scale resolution a data set as possible. Um, so I can't comment in detail to the degree to which NMPI does that at the moment. Um, but uh, I, w I want to take the opportunity to flag that it's important that it takes it down to that very fine scale to, and give a very brief example. For example, in the Firth of Clyde, there, there'll be, there are MPAs designated there, South Arran, Loch Fine, Loch Oil, Clyde Sea Sill. But outside of that, there are priority marine features, such as uh, quite de denuded merle beds around Inchmarnock, um, seagrass beds off Skipness, for example. Just giving specific examples to paint a picture of where there are important seabed habitats, and you could, you could look at the whole coast of Scotland similarly for, for little areas that don't necessarily meet national thresholds to become MPAs. And that, so that sort of scale is important for NMPI to, 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 to take on board. Um, just to quickly come back on something Phil said about um, you know, the industry to being, being asked to sort of comment on natural heritage by Scottish Natural Heritage. I mean, again, it's a resource issue. Um, our own Sea Search Citizen Science work contributes to that database, but I think everybody would agree that developers in the marine environment are um, uh, gaining the benefits from uh, use of, of a public resource, whether it's clean water or a bit of seabed or um, fish stocks or what have you. So it's entirely appropriate that the industry helps contribute to our, our evidence base about um, what, uh, what lives where and, uh, and in doing that they should also be very careful to look at what information is already available. So for example for Argyle Array, we, sorry to pick on that, but it's quite a good example where we, we knew prior to even industry doing surveys we, it looked likely that that area was possibly globally important for basking sharks. So it's just a plea that the committee recognises that you know, it's important to make best use of data that we already have, as well as generating new data through industry surveys and, and citizen science. Before I bring in witnesses further, uh, Mike Russell wanted to take that forward a bit. Yes, I, I'm, just, I'm just concerned at the present moment that we still haven't got a definitive view of what we need. You know, um, it seems to me that we're at the final stages of looking at the National Marine Plan, you know, this is the final round of discussion. Um, and yet what we've opened up here is that in terms of the data that is required for some very important decisions which will affect either existing activity, which will have a huge impact, as Callum has said, on the environment, and which will influence strongly future developments, including in renewables, uh, we are still working on a range of different data some of which will not be available to local organizations or regional organizations. I think that's a big hole. And you know, obviously the Crown Estate has one considerable contribution to make. I think, frankly, SAMS is another one and, uh, and some of the work that SAMS is doing. But it seemed to me that the people represented around this table should also be putting their voice or making their voice heard about the need for that data to be available, not just to the planners, but to those who intend to use the marine environment because access to that data will be vital for their decision making. We don't seem to have that data even within the decision makers, let alone more widely. Phil, I mean, that must be a concern for your members, because your members hold, as I know from my previous experience, a great deal of data, but they are constantly asked for more by organisations such as SNH and SEPA. Uh, that certainly is true. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one of the problems I think you have um, is that the databases are coming together, the various databases, and there has been quite a lot of movement on that over time. But the databases tend to reflect the data that has been collected for whatever reason. It doesn't necessarily reflect all the data that you would really ideally want to collect and, and pull together. So there are some gaps there. Um, so I wouldn't argue against the need for, for uh, databases. The only thing I would slightly caution on is we're looking at this with slightly fresh eyes because it's a marine development. I think actually if you came back onto uh, land, if I can put it that way, 
and look for the equivalent databases on land, there are some gaps there as well. So it's not as if this is something unique to the marine environment, it happens in other places too. But the argument for good sets of data and sets of data of the type that you need to support decisions, actually there could be no argument against that. That, that has to be brought into the equation. System more widely, I mean, you wouldn't start from there, you know, yeah. to be blunt. You know, if you're starting afresh, and this is, as you yourself said in your introductory remarks, you know, this, this plan is well in advance of what exists elsewhere, then I think we probably should take up an approach that says we need to have the right data before we start using the plan to make crucial decisions. And, and I think that is an issue which require, will require address. I, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Uh, the only thing I would comment uh, as an example is we had some discussion about climate change uh, earlier on. Uh, and yet, if you actually start to look for temperature mapping in the marine areas, you actually find that the data sets you have for that are really quite patchy, and yet it's really quite fundamental. And the same in terms of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the pH of, uh, of marine waters. There is some data, but it's actually quite patchy. So some of the really fundamental things that you would question in relation to climate change, the data just doesn't exist at the moment. I want to kind of move on, uh, but I've got a couple more people to bring in on this before I come back to Jim Hume, who can wrap it up. So Bertie first, then uh, Annie, and then back to Jim, without anybody else jumping in at the moment. Just in, in the briefest of, uh, of, of, of interventions, we need to recognize the art of the possible here. We, we tend to uh, contribute to a sense of completeness and neatness in that we need all this information. Of course we do, uh, but we'll never have it all. God's eye view of the whole sea is not possible, um, and it changes anyway. Um, therefore, the, the, the movement towards a single point to utilize all the databases, oil and gas has got a gigantic one. Uh, we've got a, a, a gigantic but very, very uh, uh, discreet set of data um, about areas of the seabed, but not others. Um, we, we should move towards that. <clears throat> we need to recognize also the matter of scale. Um, uh, small merrill beds in, in regional areas are not necessarily the most important thing. What is important is, is, is around the whole northern continental shelf. Is, is it relevant that we have merrill beds is, is still in existence and how much should be protected um, across the whole thing rather than uh, um, concentrating on a very micro scale? That, 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 that's not in our gift. Thank you. I'm not going to mix metaphors by starting hairs running uh, at this particular moment on that point. Uh, Annie Breeden. Uh, just very quickly, Callum's mentioned the Argyle Ray wind farm project a couple of times. Um, so it's worth saying that um, that project obviously gathered a lot of very useful um, data on basking shark use of the area. Um, and when the developer did essentially hand back the site to us, um, we made sure that any of the survey data that had been gathered by the developer was made sort of publicly available as quickly as possible. Um, and I know SNH and Marine Scotland were then able to use that survey data to help um, inform their consideration of um, a potential MPA for um, basking shark in the area. Indeed. Uh, Jim Hume, I think you better... Uh uh, uh, thanks, Convener. I hope, hope I don't start the whole ball r rolling again. But, of course, the original question was of specific uh, issues such as commercial anchorage and uh, navigational approaches that are not on the N NMPI. Uh, we all know there's a lot of data we don't know about, and we all know there's data all over the place. But the key to the question was really, was there specific points or specific uh, m matters that... Uh, people around this table thought should be on the NMPI that we do know of, like commercial routes, navigational routes, uh, should be on that NMPI that are not. And uh, if anybody wants to jump in very one briefly, word. exactly, just one word answers would be quite useful, I think. Items that we have not. Yeah, that should be on it. And if, if there's no answers, that's fine. But Okay, but uh, I think you've made your point. Yeah. I think they would agree. They've probably said, have you got a one-word answer, Callum? Uh, uh, yes. About you. three words. About three words. Uh, I, I, I have to come back to what Bertie said, just to say that the NAPA has to include all instances of habitats. And I was just illustrating a point about 
where regional planning can help fill gaps. So that's more than one word, sorry. No, 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 that's, that's fine. Okay, um, we do turn to the subject of sea fisheries now. And uh, Alec Ferguson is going to lead off. Uh, well, thank you, Convener. And yes, indeed, if we could just move to the sort of specific sector of, of sea fisheries. Um, uh, uh, as has already been mentioned, whatever, whatever the tone of the um, Scottish Fishermen's Federation submission to us, the fact is that the, the, the core of it uh, raises a number of concerns, particularly over the way that the um, initial concerns raised by the SFF in the way that they were dealt with, or in the SSF's terms, not dealt with, um, through the consultation process. Now, in direct contrast to that, at our meeting just before Christmas, um, Scottish Government officials assured us that they'd um, received a great deal of information uh, regarding the sea fishing sector, that, um, uh, and that this had indeed led to uh, the redrafting, complete redrafting, of the first three uh, marine planning policies. Now, my question is really fairly specific, but um, if anybody else other than Bertie wishes to comment, I hope they'll feel free to do so. Um, basically, are stakeholders now content with the redrafting of the sea fishery uh, section? Um, and if not, what major concerns um, still remain? For that, Bertie Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Convener. Yeah, th I mean, this is an area I need to be... Um, um, careful and frank. I, 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 our worst concerns are our worst concerns. And um, um, when we say we weren't consulted, in fact, we, we had a lot of um, consultation events privately with Marine Scotland in the run-up to the pre-consultation and then the consultation draft. Now, um, I, we would have liked the National Marine Plan to be the National Fishing Plan. That's where we come from. Now, of course, realistically, that's not going to happen, and, uh, and it hasn't. But what we were looking for was uh, a, a degree of even-handedness in the treatment of the fishing industry as an established um, and, indeed, with regard to local communities, very valuable um, national resource. And, and in a nutshell, there, we, we would like complete assurance, but we've got, for instance, the matter of fairness is in as a general principle. Um, the, the presumption for um, um, a certain way of addressing, for instance, cables is, is in. So uh, we, we are um, comfortable that, that um, our, our comments have been taken into account. We will always say that, that you never did everything we wanted. That's the nature of life. Um, but but uh, we are relatively satisfied with where we stand now, and we'll see what comes out uh, at the final end of this thing. I mean, it really, it was three points. One, even-handedness for, um, for uh, established uses of the sea. Um, two, please don't build a whole new framework of legislation uh, on, on, on top of the extremely comprehensive uh, uh, framework um, that, that, exists, uh, uh, that exists. And three, make a presumption in... in uh, in, in favour of, of uh, already sustainable uh, use of the seabed. Okay, Graham Day. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I, I want to, to really pursue this because in the written evidence that's before this committee, and I quote from the SFF, Marine Scotland did not seek to bring together an interested party to discuss how marine planning might lead to coexistence rather than confrontation. This failure will have consequences. The SFF is certain that those consequences will not be happy, particularly as they have been brought about by those who have little or no experience of planning in the marine environment. Now, on the subject of experience, it's an interesting viewpoint in that a few weeks ago the same organisation was quite content to have an inexperienced, unelected peer represent its interests in Brussels rather than an experienced Scottish Government Minister. But setting that to one side, that's fairly strong language. Um, does the SFA stand by it? If I might, Graham. Uh, um, that was a rerun of the, uh, the response that we made to the consultation draft. Um, the, the timescale of this within the art of the possible of the receipt, receipt of, the, of the, uh, the, the, the Scottish National Marine Plan in front of the committee um, and the outcome of the independent inquiry as to how evidence was treated and the very helpful breakdown of, of what bits had changed as a result of the consultation. None of that was available when those statements were made. Uh, when we go through 
uh, 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 the outcome, it's, it, it's a very much better picture. So that's the context. That was made for the, the consultation draft, not this one. But things have changed. Be clear, this, these comments are out of date. You're in a much better place now. They're out the of date. We're in a much better place now. That's right. a reasonable okay. statement, Graham. Right. Right, Tim, we'll have uh, Richard and Phil and then Dave Thompson with his point. Yeah, sorry, it's a uh, point really detailed, actually. Just uh, on, on the map in the fisheries section, uh, it refers to the quantity of landies in Scotland by vessels by district, which at first sight is a little bit confusing because you immediately think, my sector, you think it's by port. And one or two of the ports have highlighted that their figures are slightly out, but because it's by district, I don't know whether there's room for... Uh, manoeuvre there. For example, Dumfries and Galloway, Kukubri is not on the actual list. I presume that's grouped up in, in air and actually as I understand there's no landings at air, they're all at Troon, which mm. is just slightly confusing um, mm. in a kind of planning context and as is with Aberdeen as well, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, the, the regional view takes over and perhaps a, a more uh, detailed map might be available to supplement this perhaps. I'm sure, it, I'm sure the data is available. This is talking about page 47, yeah, sorry. Uh, for those of you who actually have the document in front of you. Uh, okay, and uh, Phil Thomas? Mine's very specific. Um, I th think the document generally, uh, both for, for fisheries and indeed for aquaculture, uh, is very light on its recognition of food security issues, which are major in my view. And the second thing that it misses out on, which um, is partly due to a timing issue, is the development of the common fisheries policy uh, changes, and in particular the emphasis from a European level on the development of aquaculture throughout the European Union. And uh, all member states are submitting uh, multi-year plans into that process. My understanding is the one for the UK has been drafted, uh, the Scottish element of that is, is already in, uh, and I would simply recommend that the committee should make sure they see that plan before it goes off, really. Okay. Uh, Dave Thompson, just to, is that a point related to this? Hmm. I think we should take your point just now and then bring in uh, Callum and then Mike with his uh, specific uh, response to, I think, to Bertie, yeah? Yeah, thank you very much, convener, and uh, good morning to... Uh, everybody, um, I just wondered, uh, just for clarification, really, from, from Bertie Armstrong and the SFF, it's been it's been good to see that uh, you know you do feel your comments were taken into account, and uh, some of the stuff here, um, you know, is a wee bit uh, out of date. That's uh, that's encouraging. It's always good to see a sinner repent. I think is maybe the way I would put it. Um, but I, I wonder, does that apply fully to your comments in relation to sustainable development in terms of where fishing sits in relation to that? Because you did go into this in, in some great detail and you have made a specific recommendation that the presumption in favour of sustainable development over and against existing economic activity be removed. So maybe just a wee bit of clarity on whether you feel that the plan is now reflecting what you feel is appropriate or is there a need in relation to that for um, further work to be done? Well, thank you uh, very much, Dave. We, we would like to see assurance that, that uh, existing economic activity, particularly that connected with food security and with the health of local communities, um, um, is supported. We always find ourselves, with regard to the health of local communities, we always find ourselves, or with regard to a bigger part, the socio-economic aspects, slightly on the back foot, because um, um, our bigger brothers in, in oil and gas and the potential of renewables, if you just gross up the figures, we're always uh, um, absolutely tiny-fied. But in your constituency, that's not the case. And in Shetland, for instance, that's not the case. Or in villages in the West Coast, that's not the case. So we, we, um, we want to see uh, a presumption that at least is even-handed, and we would like to see it specifically expressed uh, for protection of existing use. And, and, of course, in my case, talking specifically about um, protection for uh, wild capture fisheries. Um, but on the other hand, when you read the chapters, uh, um, it's implied, it, uh, even-handedness and fairness is implied. So that then takes you down to the tactical level, which generally is um, the licensing of individual developments 
and that is where we tend to run into difficulties and why we are so concerned that the overall strategy protects us because generally in force of, of, of um, capacity to lobby um, um, the, the instinct as to the size of the figures, the instinct as to the good bits of helping climate change, all that, we find ourselves cornered generally. Um, so we need to be careful about that. But in general terms, yes, it's, it, it, um, our comments have largely been taken into account. We didn't expect the whole plan to be written on the basis of our response, and sure enough, it came to pass. Um, but but, but we, we do require the protection, and I think you understand that personally from your own constituency. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much for that, and, and I do indeed. Uh, and uh, I think what you're saying is that uh, having it implied in, in, in the plan is maybe not quite enough. We need, we need something a bit more explicit. Uh, I mean, uh, fishing is probably the oldest economic activity uh, that takes place in the seas, and therefore it should be given... A, I believe, a pretty prominent position. So I would certainly support you in uh, your view that we need to firm up the value of uh, fishing in relation to the plan and make it at least equal to uh, other economic uh, activities, if not maybe a slightly higher level. I would certainly agree with that, and, uh, and also with, uh, with Phil's point that, uh, that there is the element of food security. We can easily forget that in the developed West, that you do actually need to keep producing protein from the sea, 16 or 17 percent of the world's protein. Uh, we, are, we are a small impact on that, but if you, if you stop doing that, you're leaning more heavily on somewhere else to do it for you. So, yeah. Mike Russell wants to come back. <coughs> Points, it's though. basically the same point, but I just want to get absolute clarity in it, because there's a bit of confusion in, in, in what I'm hearing. Your submission was in response to what? Because you say in your submission, it starts to say it was the 25th of July. That was to an original draft or what? It was to the consultation, the, the, to the, the, consultation. the five part okay. consultation. Okay. Now, 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 this marine plan is, is a different beast. Uh, now you've seen this marine plan, then. You are the seven point bullet points that you have put forward are reduced and changed now to three, which you have put out. If I may summarize this, because we need to be absolutely clear. First of those is essentially the right to fish issue. The second one is over-regulation. And the third one is what you now call e equity of treatment. But in this document, you actually went much further and talked about the presumption in favor of sustainable development over and against existing economic activity. What you're now saying is you just want equity of treatment for sustainable activity with other activities. If, if I may say, it's effectively the same thing. Uh, um, um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't demand or expect a presumption in favour of, of, of any one element of maritime activity over another. It, equity is bound to be, in the end, that which is realistically uh, uh, demanded. And so uh, we don't want precedence. We don't want to say, we fish there, you can't put anything there or do anything to the seabed. That's, that's silly. Um, so is that... Uh, yeah, yeah, halfway so between the two in things, other words, yeah. the seven points are now reduced to three, and you have dropped, for example, a, what appears to be demand that no part of fisheries control or management must be delegated to regional planners. Um, the, the whole subject of, uh, as we've explored here, the whole subject of, of the regional planning forums is, is so, um, is so uh, untried, untested, and indeed ill-defined at this stage that, that uh, uh, we, we, we'll need to wait and see what, what starts to happen there. Uh, um, regionalised fisheries management to that sort of level, I mean, simply won't work. But th there may be things that can be done um, locally uh, uh, without damage. For instance, in Shetland, they have their own shellfish management order. That's, that's an extra layer of, um, that, that, that's an extra layer of, of, uh, of management. It may or may not be appropriate in other areas. So we don't want to say that there should never be anything other than the CFP. But, but what we don't want is gratuitous manufacture of extra layers. Like marine management or the marine management organisation to the England East region, which you quote with great approval. Um, it, was, it was an example of somewhere where there, there seemed to be an equitable approach. I wouldn't over or underemphasise um, that as a model for us because it's different just as much as... But you say that the planning market. process should be arranged on the same principles as proposed by the marine management organisation. That would appear to be an endorsement. Um, yes, uh, but 
I'm not quite sure where we're going with this. Uh, uh, um, I'm just we, trying to get absolutely clear because it's a very important sector. It's an important sector for this committee. It's an important sector for my constituency. Yeah. I want to be absolutely clear what your organisation is saying. So, in summary, what you're saying is the right to fish, uh, no over-regulation, which I certainly agree with, and the issue of sustainability to be a issue, key issue alongside the other issues. Yes, yes. And, uh, let me give you an example of, of, of how there is a wider scope to that. It, in the matter of Shetland, w w it's been quoted several times uh, in, in the context of the marine plan as something of an exemplar. Now, the problems for the, Sh the Shetland uh, wild capture industry um, go way beyond the national marine plan. It, the problem is the Faroese fleet fishing mackerel at an, an unconscionable volume, 12.01 um, nautical miles, or what happens in the dark, let's see, uh, from, from Shetland. Their problems are the, uh, the constraints on days at sea, meaning that they can't catch their monkfish and they've been sold, they, 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 they're rented annually to somebody else to catch because they haven't got time and they've had to modify. Those sort of things are the real issues for wild cat capture fisheries. Uh, um, not necessarily the, that which will happen or will not happen uh, um, inside the regional planning. So the, with regard to regional planning, the way it's organized in, by the MMO in that one bit seems to us, as uh, we, we've mentioned this plan is ahead, they are in fact ahead in the matter of, uh, of the, uh, the, the, what they call ICFAs, uh, um, inshore conservation of fisheries areas, uh, which we call IFGs. They're, 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 they're way ahead of us. And, and that was quoted simply as an example of how um, it might or might not work. But it's not a prescription yet for, for anything that happens uh, um, in, inside the regional planning, um, the, the, the regional planning partnerships, because those are not properly defined yet. <laughs> I think so. The, the seven points have been reduced to the three. Effectively so. Okay. Dave? Uh, it was just really to kind of follow on on, on that little dis discussion there. And uh, uh, Mike might think he's clear and Bertie might think he's clear. I'm not sure I'm totally clear. But um, we are speaking to the Cabinet Secretary next week and we've got a, a wee while yet before we come up with our final report in relation to this. Uh, I'm sure it would be appropriate if the SFF wanted to uh, submit a, a relatively short document just clarifying absolutely the position based on the latest marine plan and not an initial uh, consultation that that would be helpful for us to receive. Can we leave you at this? If, if uh, the time scale is short, of course. At this point, before we move on to another oh subject. I agree with Bertie that the industry should be on a level foot and we should recognise the industry as, as a broad range of players. Um, uh, fishing plans should be subject to strategic environment assessment as other plans are and we, we, in our submission we called for displacement scenarios in the National Marine Plan to be subject to SEA and for those assessments to be made and for fishing to be spatially managed and integrated with marine planning as we think it should be uh, we'd welcome the clear mapping out of, of activity of both over 15 and under 15 metre vessel because all that information is out there and it's not been pulled together and I think that would really help take forward uh, a strategic level playing field. We need another discussion on that, do we? Uh, I, just, I just need to, to reject that out of hand. Uh, fishing in, in general terms happens uh, um, everywhere. It is subject to climate change. Uh, um, the, the specific uh, subject, subjecting of uh, fishing uh, to um, the inspection as a specific plan or project is specifically to do with Natura 2000 sites and not fishing in the northern continental shelf or anything remotely resembling it. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and so, no, that, 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 that is not a way to proceed at all. Well, both of your points are noted, and uh, we shall take it to the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mike Russell, you want to come in on aquaculture, I believe. Uh, only very briefly, I just wanted to really fulfil. I was a little surprised to see the reiteration of the national targets in the plan. I wasn't entirely sure that's where they should be. But you've made it very clear that you can't, don't believe those national targets can be met without an expansion on the East Coast. You've referred to it 
east and north. You re referred to it again. Suppose that wasn't to happen. What's the potential for reaching the targets, given the targets have existed for some time and haven't been reached yet? Okay. Well, I th think um, there are two or three points that are separate here. Firstly, the north and east coast issue, uh, I don't think, is an issue in relation to the targets. You, you can reach the targets within the existing area, uh, largely on the basis of expansion of existing farm uh, activity. Uh, but that, that's salmon and, and, and uh, trout and, and the same for shellfish. The issue about the north and east coast is that at the moment they present in effect a planning blight on a large part of coastal areas. Now the reality is that uh, on the west coast areas that we, where we farm at the moment, almost nothing is going to be, certainly nothing at the moment, is going to be as profitable as salmon farming. And therefore that's, that area is going to remain dominated by salmon farming. If you don't have uh, opportunities to develop on the north coast and the east coast for other species, then what you're saying is Scotland's not interested in, in other new species. And it's not a salmon farmer's issue, but as a general issue in relation to aquaculture, uh, we think that's important. That isn't well explained in the plan, and, and the plan perhaps needs to be broader in terms of what its expectations are of the industry, yeah. rather than so specific. Uh, well, I think in terms of the figures in, in the plan, uh, they came about through the industry being asked a question of what is a re reasonable rate of development. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm not telling you anything that I haven't said in public before, but the way that came about, uh, and in, indeed the way the targets came about, was that uh, the rate of expansion in the market is about 8% per year, or has been about 8% per year. The rate that we thought was achievable to develop farming through the planning system was about 4% per year. Um, my concern at the moment, uh, I think, is, is we are reasonably up, we're slightly behind, but reasonably up to the rate of development that would get us to the 2020 target. But we do now have a situation where, frankly, the real question is all about maintaining investment. And that was why, at the beginning, uh, I was keen to stress that this document is in a sense a prospectus for investors because the reality is that there are lots of places in the world that investment can be made in marine development and if we're going to remain competitive and, and move forward in the way that we would like, we want to maintain our position in that. Graham Day. Yeah, uh, as Phil Thomas knows from previous discussions, I'm not an expert on aquaculture, so, so forgive me this question. My understanding of why aquaculture is predominantly based in the West is because of the, there are shelter provided in the West for the industry to can be conducted because of the islands, and that may be wrong. Therefore, is it not quite challenging to develop aquaculture in the North and particularly on the East Coast? Because if I remember right, isn't the most infamous escape from a fish farm what happened in the North, in Shetland, the one that caused the most damage? And was that, that not weather related? Well, Shetland is a well developed area already, of course. Uh, and and uh, I, think, I think the incident you're referring to was uh, where a year or two back a farm was actually carried away over a headland. Uh, the, the, the seas were at that level. Um, in short, the basis of your comment is correct in the sense that the reason that aquaculture developed first in the West was because it's very high quality water and more sheltered water. The pattern now is that the industry is progressively moving to more exposed positions because the technology has improved. Um, even using existing technology, there are areas uh, along the north coast and uh, down the east coast that would be appropriate for aquaculture. Indeed, historically, there were one or two farms uh, in the Murray Firth, for example, that were there. Um, the area of conflict where you would, would, would get, with existing forms of aquaculture at least, is you really can't put salmon farming in any area where there's water contamination and, and therefore any of the areas of the East Coast where you're getting significant marine contamination from effluent coming offshore, those areas are not there. You also need to have an appropriate depth of water uh, and uh, you know, by and large that rules out some of the areas on the southwest coast for example because you tend to have uh, shallow sandy uh, beaches and some areas, not all areas, on the southeast uh, coast as well. But there are opportunities, 
Uh, and, and I think for us, uh, you know, the notion that there's an illogicality about saying, well, we should have a presumption against development because nobody at the moment is looking to develop there because there is a presumption against development. If that presumption was removed, I have no idea uh, what species might uh, evolve, but the opportunity would be there for somebody to come in and look for a development there. Okay, thank you. Uh, without going into the whole history and development of the salmon farming industry and other species, uh, Callum uh, Duncan, a short comment on this before we move on to something else you'll probably want to comment on. Uh, just to flag concerns that the, uh, the Habitats Regulations Appraisal um, results of the screening showed that an appropriate assessment of this National Marine Plan uh, wasn't required. We were concerned about that. Um, one of the concerns we have around that is the growth target in the aquaculture sector. We're, you know, we're in favour of sustainable development, but we think that growth target is a matter of concern in the plan. It's inconceivable to, to ourselves that such growth would not potentially have an impact on European marine sites, and therefore we'd like to understand why an appropriate assessment of this plan was not required, and that's something we can maybe ask. Cabinet the Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, I think. We, we will take two points, the two points of view. We've heard that, I think. We know what your point of view is. The, is the growth is actually very, very small. And, and in the reality, I think, at the moment, is we're just a few tons ahead of where, where the industry was in about 2001. So you can almost argue that if you took the 2001 reference point, up to now there has been, been uh, no growth. So the growth is actually very small. If you ask me what the growth potential was, the growth potential is very substantial in my view, and part of that includes moving further offshore, which takes you into a wholly different set of technologies. But aquaculture is going to develop. The, the uh, piece of debate, if you like, is how much of it is going to develop in Scotland as opposed to develop elsewhere in the world, and that all comes down to investment. Okay, I think we'll leave it at that particular point just now. We want to move on to the subject of cabling. And uh, we uh, have seen a number of comments here about the content of uh, the marine plan, which talks about cable should be buried to maximise protection where there are safety or seabed stability risks and to reduce conflict with other marine users and protect the assets and the infrastructure. So there's a couple of points of view here. Uh, obviously, uh, we know that GPS, for example, can allow people who are uh, travelling across areas where there are cables and pipelines to be able to identify where these are. So there seems to be uh, less of a problem, from my point of view, of a conflict with other users. But uh, perhaps Alan Broadbent might want to deal with the, uh, the question from uh, both the financial and the environmental point of view. Yeah, yeah. Well, the first thing to say is that these cables have been there for some time and, and we've no plans to expand upon them unless, of course, some other Scottish island than the 59 we supply becomes inhabited and we'd have to, to look at that. But, but these cables are already there. There are, there are 59 islands, 111 separate cables. They've been there for some considerable period of time. They do supply tens of thousands of customers on the Scottish islands. And I would suggest, in, in, the, in the words of the, Mr. Armstrong, I think they would count themselves as established users of the sea. They need those cables to get supply. So I think they've got every right to be concerned about what's in this plan. We've got some experience of the plan because I, I do believe and we believe it was being employed when we had the mainland Jura uh, situation when we tried to replace that particular cable. I'll be the first to admit that, that took far too long we left those customers on, a diesel, on diesel generation sets for far too long. They had faults because of that. We had to man it for 24 hours. That was a serious issue, and that needs to be addressed in the plan, and it isn't. In terms of environmentally, just to touch on that first of all, and uh, Mr. Day talked about EMFs in the, in the previous meeting. EMFs are, are pretty well dealt with scientifically on the, on the land side, and we do have exposure limits through central government that deal with that. The same limits, I would assume, but I'm no expert in that matter in the sea, would apply. So certainly from a human level, there are absolutely no issues that, that, that I would be aware of in terms of that. 
And in terms of marine, I don't think, and indeed the, the plan itself says there isn't any evidence in terms of marine. Well, all I can say to you is, when we do inspections of our cables, we find significant marine life around them. Now, I know that's not saying it's necessarily a good thing, but we find a lot of marine life around our cables. That, that is a fact of... But, but you come back to the other issue about the economic issue. We, we, are, we are just finished a price control with our regulator. We are a heavily regulated business. Our income over the next eight years from April 2015 is governed by us submitting a business plan to Ofgem, the regulator. We have a bit of negotiation along the way, although in, in, in essence Ofgem tell us what they're going to give us and we get back to them and try and get a wee bit more based on what we believe is the right level of expenditure to serve our customers going forward. And largely, we got what we asked for in this particular price control off gem, have given it to us. However, when Jura Mainland happened, we were in a completely different position. We had submitted for £48 million to both replace some of the cables and repair them. This policy, if you were to protect or underground all of those cables, adds £280 million onto effectively customers' bills. That, that, that's the bottom line. You know, that, that's the reality of it. And, and, and I'm not saying we're not prepared to, to review that through a cost-benefit analysis. What actually happened was after we had applied for a license, or indeed it was actually when we were discussing with Marine Scotland the subject of a license, and they mentioned you're going to have to underground this, we took it so seriously we, we organised a meeting between the regulator, Marine Scotland and us because we knew that we were far short in the amount of money we needed for that in that particular price control. Ofgem came to the meeting, we talked about it and agreed, or at least we thought we agreed, that this would be done in a cost-benefit analysis going forward. It would be proportionate, it would be, we would do the right thing from an evidence perspective, and it would be risk assessed. Now I have to say, we had to get the, the mainland Jura cable done more quickly than that could be done, but we did say to Marine Scotland we would be prepared to do that afterwards. Now, in every single case, we were prepared to do that afterwards if there were a fault, for instance. And we are perfectly prepared to talk to the stakeholders and agree what their concerns are. Are there any safety aspects? And I would say to you, to our knowledge, there are no safety aspects have happened, either injuries or deaths, to any of our cables. There are, there are none. And we've got the Marine Accident Investigation Board figures going back 20 years, there are none in there. Okay, so there, there is no issue as far as we are concerned in terms of safety, but I do accept that each circumstance might be different and we need to discuss that with the stakeholders. We absolutely accept that, but what we find is we've got Chapter 10, which A, we believe wasn't fully consulted about in terms of distribution cables and absolutely needs to be. I think Mr. Russell is correct. It's both specific and explicit. And it actually, it, it, I think it takes some skill to be specific and explicit and yet unclear. And that's the reality of what our Appendix 2 says. Now, we, we've made these comments previously. We made them in the first consultation. We made them in the second. And as far as I'm concerned, they were largely ignored. So we need, as I said at the very beginning, for, for Chapter 14, 14 to be consulted upon again, we will contribute to that. We are perfectly happy to go forward on a cost-benefit analysis, but we want evidence to be in there. We want it to be risk assessed because our primary concern is our customers on the islands. It's not about this business. It's about the customers on the islands from security, from economics, and they will actually have a downside on that if this goes through in the way it is at the moment. Okay, but there's lots of other kinds of cables and pipelines that exist at the present time. For example, we've been uh, joining up many of the islands with uh, broadband. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether these have been buried or not. Uh, I certainly know that uh, there's lots of pipelines in the North Sea that are not buried into the bargain. So we're talking about something which is being put in a plan here. And it looks as though perhaps the best element that might be drawn out of this from my point of view might be on a case by case basis looking at the potential for burial uh, Alan that's essentially what we're saying but provided that the plan contains with it in it at the highest level proportionality risk assessment and evidence and I have to say that the evidence 
was, was scant, if not non-existent, on the Jura cable. And we've been forced to protect it or underground it down to the 50 metre mark. Now, I, I don't believe that was right, and I don't think that's in our customer's interest, but we had to agree to it because we had to get the cable in. That was the reality of life. But that's exactly what we're saying, convener, going forward. But we need that in the plan. And just to finally say on that, we need that in the plan. And I, or we are concerned in the point that Mr. Russell made today and last time is that if you're not very specific at the high level there and it gets moved out to local marine plans and during licensing, we will have a really difficult job to get this through because that was what happened in mainland Jura. Mike Russell. Yes, um, the Jura example needs to be borne firmly in mind by members of this committee and those who are discussing this. I just, you know, I just want to stress the point that Alan has made. For six months, that cable was not operating. The Bomar diesel sets were operating flat out. They were going into a winter which, if you've been in the winter in Isla, you know, can be very harsh indeed. The people living next to the Bowmore diesel sets were subjected to really fairly intolerable conditions for six months. Sounds silly, but they were, and they were complaining about it. And the cost of operating that system was very substantial indeed. I'm sure Alan will bear that out. Now, in the chronology, Alan, that you have given in your evidence, I just want to press on two points. There are two gaps in the chronology where things don't appear to be happening. One is between June the 20th and July the 28th, when my assumption is you were preparing the application for the licence. Uh, am I right? Absolutely, but it was at that point when we discussed things with Marine Scotland, for the first time we realised we were going to be forced to put a cable underground. The second one, and this is where the worry about the plan exists, is the gap that takes place between August the 18th and October the 28th. That's 11 weeks. There has been a consultation, the consultation is finished, and for 11 weeks there is inaction on supplying all these people in Jura, Isla and Colonsay, because the three islands were affected by this, all these people just wait to find out what's happening. What was happening during that period? Well, you're not quite right about the date. It was the 13th of November that we yes. actually got a license. Yeah, in, yeah but you got the draft license on the 28th. Something happened. What, what was happening was Marine Scotland were... We were in discussions with Marine Scotland. We, we, we still believed that... Uh, they, they, at that point, actually, they had said underground the whole cable, so eight kilometres have been undergrounded. They then changed that policy to the 50 metre contour for, for a reason that I, I don't know, but at least it helped us because it made it easier to, to, to get the cable in. And there were a lot of discussions, one of which was the off chair meeting, which was absolutely fundamental for us because what I didn't say, what came out of the off chair meeting was they agreed to give us what's called a reopener in the price control so that we have now got a situation where whatever money we spend in the price control, we can recover uh, 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 through the off gem reopener. But again, that goes directly on to, to customers in terms of that. So there was a lot of things happening at that point. We were obliged to speak to stakeholders at that point because we had to also start developing a cable protection plan that was very difficult to do because generally speaking, if you're going to put a cable under the seabed as opposed to on the seabed, which 110 of our cables already are, it's a completely different survey you've got to do. You're not actually entirely sure what the seabed's like underneath. And some of that work had to be done and some discussions had to be held during that period. But we didn't, if we had got, we were pressing for a license earlier so that we could have actually went and caught an neap tide, which we needed in this particular case, and good weather. And I think we were particularly fortunate on December the 7th to get good weather and the neap tide. Extraordinary job to get the cable in in that period of time. I mean, I was astonished to get the first email saying it started to lay it, and I virtually turned around and you got the email in to say they finished laying it. I thought it was a remarkable job. But just to compress this into a simple thing for, mm -hmm. for, for those who are involved, you are arguing that there should be a special section on replacing cable, uh, which I think is correct. I think it has to happen because these are circumstances in which you're providing, uh, continuing a service which exists. You're also arguing that the provisions of the Marine Plan, which I think you're right, which were essentially operated during this time, led to an unacceptable delay in ensuring that the community was, was, had the service that it needed. 
we have an example. It's yes. not often you have a specific example that feeds into yeah. what is a draft policy, and I believe the two are related, and that is the case. I, I know that that's a view on Jura, for example, that, and, and yeah. Isla, particularly on Isla, that yeah. the Marine Plan was operating, and it didn't operate well in the interests of my constituents. Yeah. So, I mean, I very much support that, but there will be other views but I do think there needs to be a special provision for replacement cables. Can you just confirm you're not planning new marine cables? No, there, there are none. We are the, the distribution business. Uh, the transmission business and renewables mm -hmm. are quite different. They, they've got different commercial imperatives, and I can fully understand why they would want to underground their cables. And I think, right. for the most part, renewables do underground their cables in the sea, as does transmission, but it's a different commercial imperative, okay. and the cables do different things. And therefore, a case-by-case -case basis with the presumption for new cables would be buried, but replacement cables, particularly in urgent circumstances, would be subject to a different set of regulations. Well, well no, the, 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 I, the I, new cables being completely new. Yes, yeah, I, I think, yes, yes completely I, new. I, yeah. completely. Re replacement, I mean, we've been replacing cables for 60 years on the seabed, like for like, and we haven't had a problem with that. All of a sudden, it's a problem. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Bertie Armstrong, and then a question mm -hmm. from Claudia Vimish. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Governor. I think, <clears throat> I think we're discussing um, a matter uh, which is to do with one license <clears throat> and is a tactical matter. Sorry, forgive me. <clears throat> is a tactical matter. Um, section 14 on submarine cables. <clears throat> oh, goodness me. Section uh, 14 on submarine cables is, is uh, the strategic plans, and as uh, has just been mentioned, um, um, it, it doesn't apply to all things that are led across the seabed, for instance, the transmission cables from renewables. Um, th there is indeed another point of view, and, and the, th the things I would take issue with, one are um, um, electricity, electricity cables are not um, um, a contributor to uh, uh, fish stocks that there may be anecdotal evidence of, of, of clustering, but that's, that's, we, can, we can lay that to one side. Second, the fact that you've not detected um, an accident involving catching of cables, um, um, it seems to imply that there is no danger of death from catching an obstruction in the seabed uh, uh, by a fishing vessel. That is not correct either. Uh, there, there are many examples of, uh, particularly with scallop dredgers, where, where th th there is a danger of death from catching seabed obstruction. So it's a bit like saying, you know, I haven't used my, I've got nine years, um, no claims bonus on my insurance, therefore I don't need it. Um, th there is a danger of death, and we ought to look carefully at this. For the life of me, I can't see what's wrong with the objectives uh, um, in, in uh, section 14. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I understand um, the plight of the Jura and the other three islands um, uh, electricity users during this. But we, we would be roundly frightened by a clause that says you can just lay um, electricity supply cables, replacement electricity uh, supply cables across the seabed uh, um, without, with, without further ado. I hope that's not what you're asking for, and, 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 and we would object to that roundly. Um, why it took six months to, to, to replace the, the emergency cable, of course I understand, is a, is, is a matter of a problem to the users. Um, but if there's going to be a further consultation on this, then we will certainly participate, because there are two sides to this argument. We're, we're not asking for don't even think of putting a cable where, there, where a cable existed before and where no, no problems seem to um, um, occur. But what we do want is the objectives that are laid down in, in 14 to be properly looked at, and that is to protect submarine cables while achieving successful seabed user coexistence. Can I Alan Brogan. Respond quickly to that. I, I think, that as a general point, I think there is partly an issue about people's understanding of what these cables are and what they're not. And I, I hopefully I've explained today they are quite different to renewables, they're quite different to transmission. They've been there a long time. We're asking to renew and replace. And we, we've existed alongside fishermen and other, share, and other ray stakeholders for a very long time with no with no particularly big issue. So I'm, I'm okay with that. The marine life point was actually just about the EMFs don't appear to be affecting the barnacles. It wasn't about you're, you're attracting uh, fish or anything else. The accident statistics from the MEIB indicate there, are, there were no Scottish cables at all 
uh, in that, but it did indicate there were rocks affected, there were wrecks being uh, pulled, and I accept the fact that could happen. What I'm saying is there is no evidence it has happened. So on a risk basis, you may very well take that into account. In terms of the, the, the chapter, I would recommend you read our evidence, Appendix 2, where we highlight why this may very well be specific and explicit, but it's unclear and confusing, and we do worry further down the line it will impact on our customers badly. And we're really concerned about that, that particular point. And, uh, and I'm certainly not saying we are going to lay, that's not what I said to Mr. Armstrong, that we are just going to lay cables willy-nilly. I would like to do it pretty well the way we've done it for the last 60 years, where we've actually had a really good relationship with the stakeholders and indeed Marine Scotland. We've got the cables in a good time. Customers had their supply restored, and it hasn't been an undue burden on customers' bills. That's what I would like to return to. And if we can write that into Chapter 14, so much the better. Uh, I think we've got both of your points of view on this. I think. Uh, Graham Day has a point on one, and then well, we have a question. Yeah, I, I just want to get some clarity on this, Camille, because safety is absolutely paramount, no doubt about that. But isn't what Alan Broadbent is seeking and asking for simply arrangements that continue the existing coexistence between fishing and the submarine cables because as I understand it all he's talking about is replacing cables as they require to be replaced in exactly the same location in the same way and if the fishing industry already know where these cables are um, I don't see what the problem is and I would seriously question why you would be scallop dredging in an area where you know there are known to be cables surely that just would not happen Yep. A point taken, uh, uh, um, but I, I, I reiterate, I'm, I'm not quite sure why we would want to depart from the objectives as they're laid down. Of course there needs to be um, um, coexistence. This was, it, it's, it's really quite difficult when you pick through one example, when you're actually talking about a strategic principle. Uh, uh, this one example was, was, was not a shining example of coexistence. We had meetings called the night before. Uh, um, the night before work was due to happen. We knew for a fact that, that assets had been booked uh, um, um, to carry out a lay before a consultation had taken place with, with uh, uh, um, um, the local fishing groups. So I think it's down to um, um, a licensing argument uh, um, about this specific thing. And we could go on forever uh, uh, um, talking about that specific argument. No, this is very Bertie, and it, it, you know, it does need to be understood in that regard. This is an example of a cable that failed in June, that there was an endless process in which the community got incredibly frustrated, in which there was discussion with the fishing community because it was going on in September and October, and I know that as a local member, and we got to the stage that they required an enormous push to get the cable in place be before the winter weather came in to, well, it was coming in already to Isla. This is a very good example because it was being run on the principles of the plan. That's exactly the point that Alan is making. And therefore, what it tells us is that the principles in the plan do not allow for replacement of cables that break and require urgent change. And therefore, that is the change that's required. Nobody is arguing for a blanket change, but there requires to be a replacement, like for like replacement, when communities are disadvantaged. This is a very good example. Excellent example. Okay. And, and what might be entirely appropriate, therefore, uh, uh, when, when you are making um, a presumption, as you've just, or uh, uh, making a regulation or a direction, as you've just explained, uh, would be another direction to the, uh, the cable company to make sure that planned maintenance and, and a replacement of cables took place, um, took place uh, 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 to mitigate the risk of creating this blind emergency. How old was the cable and why did it break in June? Have you any evidence on that? No, you've just made a statement which indicates no, some statement. doubt no. about the company's maintenance. I I mean, did, I did have not, you any evidence on I did not make a statement. I made a suggestion. If you're going to say we require in statute some means of, of uh, rapidly replacing uh, broken cable, then that sounds reasonable. I would say it would be reasonable to place in statute also another statement which said thou shalt maintain the things and uh, 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 schedule their replacement uh, realistically. Well, 
the statute does, because the ESQCR yes. regs, the electricity safety quality continuity regulations, require us to do that. Although, of course, every regulation these days is at a very high level, yeah. and it won't be specifically saying do that for submarine cables or and anything else. Having said that, I'm proud of our company's yeah. record in terms of ESQCR yeah. uh, doing the right things. And I think the fact is, any cable or any equipment will fail at some time or another, and if it doesn't, my regulator is going to say to me, you're not operating economically and efficiently because you're replacing it too often. So there's a reality of life there that we've all got to face up to that uh, some things will fail, some of cables occasionally will fail, and we will have to be able to replace them very quickly. And, I, I, all, of that's, all of that's agreed, none of which explains why, why there would be any resistance to, to a statement in the statute for, for, by way of balance. That, uh, that, that, that would require what is already there to be simply nodded towards. Why did it break in June? Well, I think you can ask these questions out with this. Yeah. Uh, we hear your point of view. We've heard uh, what the cable company has said. Uh, we note the points uh, as it states in part three in the marine planning policies, cables to the following factors will be taken into account on a case by case basis, etc. And I think we're dealing with a whole lot of issues there that would allow this to be quite clear. Uh, and uh, we will ask the Cabinet Secretary about these points you have made. Claudia Beamish. Right. Uh, thank you, Convener. It's simply a brief um, point of clarification for um, Alan Broadbent. And I would just like to ask you, what sort of cost-benefit analysis um, on a case-by-case -case basis looking to the future would actually come up with um, anything other than um, the, the fact that if you're, if you're quoting the £280 million on, on customers' bills, that what would come up with anything other than the, 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 the cheapest option when there's that pressure? And, and what sort of cost-benefit analysis is your, are you using? Well, yeah, the, the first part of the question is, as I said, we just went through a price control with the regulator. That every single piece of expenditure and investment we proposed had to have a CBA attached to it, and it was essentially based on the UK Government Green Book. So that, that was essentially what, what it was based on. And at the meeting with Ofgem, they suggested that would be the way forward to do that. We've already begun to think about how we would do it going forward. We would be drawing in a lot more expert advice than maybe previously we, we have had. We may well discover issues that we didn't previously realise were there, but I do take your point entirely. It's difficult for me as an engineer who's laid a lot of these cables in, in, in my time to see what particular situation could, could actually uh, overturn that. Having said that, there may be some shorter cables, there may be cables in particular areas of fishing intensity that may be vet or other stakeholder uh, activity that we may very well choose to factor in and choose to put them under, put them underground or to protect them. So that there, are, there are conceivably areas, but on the face of it, I think that the 110 cables that are already in and on the seabed, there was effectively a CBA done for those. And at that point, there was no, re, no clear reason why you would spend up to six times more to put the cable underneath the seabed. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to move on to a, a final point, possibly, I hope, uh, of the relationship between the National Marine Plan and the Crown Estate. Uh, as we know, uh, the Smith, Smith Commission has uh, proposed uh, the transfer of uh, Crown Estate powers both to uh, Scotland and uh, to particularly local areas. Uh, there are practical points that are raised within this and it's a, a moot point about just exactly how that's going to be done. But uh, I wonder if any of the witnesses you know, think that uh, the marine plan needs to be changed in the light of the Smith Commission proposals. Uh, probably the marine plan won't be completed in any way till after the uh, heads of uh, subject are agreed at the end of this month on the potential bill related to the Smith Commission proposals. So, uh, you know, if I could be more specific, maybe Annie would like to make a comment about that just now. Um, I mean, I think, the, I think there's very few direct references in the plan to the Crown Estate. There's some references to um, our functions, um, I think, in terms of leasing and in terms of renewable energy leasing rounds. Um, so there may be the need to make some minor, you know, very minor um, changes to semantics, I think, but as a, as a whole, um, 
I don't I don't believe that it needs um, much change to be honest given okay. um, the changes that will happen okay uh, which may or may not happen in the form that they are uh, outlined yes Phil Thomas I'm, <clears throat> I'm not sure that the, the plan will necessarily be the place to deal with it as I was saying earlier I think it actually throws up a whole series of new issues and my guess would be that the easiest way to deal with it in the plan is simply to make reference to the, the fact that the change is either being considered or has taken place uh, and that the consequences of that change will be dealt with in some other document in some way. Okay. Uh, so uh, everybody's happy with uh, where we're at with that. It's kind of a, on a moving platform at the moment. But uh, I thought I would finish up with that one just in case anybody else had a view. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's very helpful indeed. Uh, you've given us a lot of thought uh, and material to mull over. Uh, you've uh, provided us with a, a morning of uh, considerable interest. Uh, I'd like to thank all the witnesses for your efforts uh, and your input. They are all valued. Uh, the written ones as well as those which have been taken orally just now. Uh, so thank you very much for that. We're going to call a short break for five minutes to allow the witnesses to uh, remove themselves, uh, for us to get a short comfort break and for us to deal with the final item in public uh, on, a, on agenda item two in a minute or two. So we'll have a break.
Now back to the agenda. I have a call meeting to order. Thank you. Agenda item two, public bodies consent. Second item today is for us to consider as members a Scottish Government memorandum relating to the public bodies abolition of homegrown timber advisory committee order 2014 draft. It is a UK instrument. The Scottish Parliament must give its consent to the order. Are there any questions to be raised? There do not seem to be any questions. Um, having <laughs> uh, therefore, I invite members to decide whether the committee agrees to recommend to the Parliament that the draft motion as set out in the public body consent memorandum is approved. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, future meeting details next week on the, tw the 14th of January. The committee will take evidence on the National Marine Plan with the Cabinet Secretary and consider its draft report on Part 4 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill in private. I close the meeting now. Thank you for your attention.